Hey, come up here on BBC One at 8.50 tonight. Truly priceless. Looking at this great house in the chateau style, you might well think that we're in the French countryside, say on the banks of the River Loire, but we are in fact in Buckinghamshire, just six miles west of Aylesbury. This is Wadston Manor, home for more than a hundred years of the Rothschild family. It was in the 1870s that the Baron Ferdinand de Rothschild decided to build this great country house as a centre for his two passions, collecting the decorative arts and entertaining his friends. The Baron's first love as a collector was for French furnishings, so for him a 16th century style chateau was the perfect house. We'll be showing you inside Wadston next week in a special edition of the Antiques Roadshow, but for this programme we've taken up temporary residence in the garden, and in these magnificent grounds around his house the Baron's vision was equally remarkable. Baron Ferdinand first became familiar with this land and its commanding hill when he came out here from London for winter hunting weekends at Leighton Buzzard. From the top of the hill he saw grand views in all directions, and when in 1874 his father died, he had the means to make those views his own. This was a major undertaking. The top of the hill had to be levelled, and the land scooped away on both sides to enhance the views. The parkland was as devoted to the pleasure of his guests as the manor itself. Every morning after breakfast, parties would be organised to inspect first the stables and the horses, and then take in the aviary, with its extraordinary collection of exotic birds, before climbing back up the hill for lunch. But the Rothschilds, of course, have not just been great collectors and patrons of the arts, they've also been leading figures in the world of wine. And this one cellar contains 15,000 of the finest bottles of wine in the world, all from the two great Rothschild estates in Bordeaux, Lafitte and Mouton. This, for instance, is a venerable old bottle of Chateau Lafitte, 1895. Imagine this was created before two world wars, a great wine for a grand occasion. And this, a 1973 Mouton. These post-war Mouton vintages, always distinctive because of the labels which were commissioned by the Baron from contemporary artists of the day. This one, of course, was by Picasso. In 1955, Georges Braque was commissioned. In 1958, it was the turn of Salvador Dali. And a very good year indeed. More recently, Francis Bacon created the label for the 1990. You know, this is the one room I think I've ever been in where I wish they'd lock me up and throw away the key. It's in the gardens above these cellars that we've set up our cameras today. So, let's now go out and join our experts with the people of Buckinghamshire. This has to be the biggest Noah's Ark I've ever seen. Now, how many animals have they got? My grandfather thought there was about 500 in it. It was given to him when he was a boy by Leopold Rothschild. Uh, how interesting. It was a Christmas gift uh, to my grandfather. Can you date it back, well, precisely? Well, he, he wrote in his hand on the, on the back oh. here the, the history of it, and he says in the 1880s, well, About he, Christmas 1880. He, yes. How marvellous. He'd have been 11 at the time. You brought something else too, haven't you? Well, yes, this comes from my wife's family. It was given to her father when he was a boy, I, I think just before the First World War. Has it ever been out of its box? I suppose well, it must have been. Uh, you, you'll see when you take it out. When he was a boy, my father-in-law had it out and he had a friend and they were playing with it on the floor. After the friend had gone, one of the lamps had disappeared. The, the oh. friend had obviously pinched it. And a little bit of damage to the plaster driver. But yeah. that is an absolutely fantastic car. Um, it's made by a company called Corette. Oh. George Corette. Uh, one of the greatest of the German manufacturers. The Corette company was founded in 1886. And it only ran through until 1917, so its period of manufacture was really relatively short. Um, let's just look at the quality here. 
It's hand painted with hand lining. The accessories are finished in nickel. Another good indication of quality, you've got rubber tires on the wheels. And altogether, it's a very weighty object. And what I like particularly is the realism of these padded, simulated leather seats. Aren't they great? Now, value. Toys are very collectible today. And really, you've got two toys from two different eras, but both of them are extremely valuable. The Noah's Ark, with its history, I would say we're talking about between perhaps 10 and 15,000 pounds. How much? Between 10 and 15,000 pounds. And no, the motor no. car, between 6 and 8,000. My goodness. I, I, I mean, it's worth that. I mean, my grand, grandfather was a typical farmer and everything was nails and bits of string, and he'd obviously done one or two repairs on some of the animals from well, time to time. Well, the most important thing is that it survived. Now, one of the things I always enjoy seeing on the roadshow is furniture made out of bears. But this is a particularly fine set of three bears making a seat. Why have you got it? Where did it come from? It came from Interlaken in Switzerland. In Switzerland, yes. right. My father had it made perfectly for him. So it was a commissioned piece? Yes. And he uh, wanted a father bear, mother bear, and baby bear. So he's got the three bears he's here. He's got the three bears. He wanted Very the good. three bears like that. Now, do we know when he placed that commission? Well, I think it must have been the late 20s. Well, I think late that's 20s, very interesting. Yes. Because, as I say, we see these sort of pieces very often, yes. always different, yes. fascinating things, and one is inclined to always say, oh, they're late Victorian. Now, yes. with this, of course, we have this catalogue. Yes. Now, this is the most revealing document I've ever seen in this subject. But what is interesting to me is, thumbing through this catalogue, we find the whole range of bare furniture That's that it. turns up yes. over the years on the show. And I would never have put it as late as the 1920s. I, I can say to you, I've always been wrong. What this represents is the continuity of a tradition yes. that is essentially Victorian or 19th century yes. into the 20th century yes. and probably beyond. Um, the association of wood carving and animals, particularly with southern Germany, Bavaria, Switzerland, of course, is well known. Yeah. Uh, but the bear somehow has a particular fascination. And looking at this catalogue, that comes home to me. One can have bear everything here. Um, bear decanter holders, it, yeah. um, bear clothes, brushes, anything you want to could be made. Well. You've got bookends. Yeah. Do you know what he paid? Well, I couldn't. I looked in the back of that catalogue. There is, a price there is a price stick there, but it's, but it's in French francs. It's and, French francs. And I'm afraid my exchange rates for the 1920s are not very good. No, nor mine, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we can't do it. No, we can't do it. Um, I can tell you what it would fetch today, um, because these are quite collectible, they're quite desirable, yes. and I would put something like five to eight hundred pounds on it. But of course, that doesn't really relate no. to the value of what it means to you as a family piece. No. And I've now got to reconsider everything I ever thought about carved bears. <laughs> I inherited them from my mother, and I, before that they belonged to her mother and to her uncle, my great uncle. Right. So, have you thought about when they might have been made and what they were for? I really, I think they might be for snuff, but I'm not sure, and I, I really don't know much about them. Right, they are snuff boxes. Yeah. With this one, which is going to date from the, we're looking at the early part of the 19th century. In marvellous, the way they've set in. This is micro mosaic. And these tiny, tiny pieces of stone set into the top. And again, the patience to produce something. Yeah. It's actually a wee bit easier as a technique than is often thought. I mean, they don't sort of cut them all to that size and doggle them into position. They actually have little rods and then smooth it down. So it makes it a, a little bit easier. Then to this one, which has the most superb uh, enamel on the lid. But what have you been doing to it? I know, I know. Long before they were mine, I, I, I can't throw any light on that at all. I know it's yes, quite badly it's, damaged. It's quite badly damaged yeah. there. It needs a top restorer. Yes. Again, the wonderful flowers there, and it's such a shame that that, that damage has occurred. But uh, it's not beyond redemption. The scene on the top. Um, as far as I can see, there, it's, it's Mercury, of course, with his winged hat. And um, I think this is almost certainly Diana. But a beautiful example of the enamelous art. I mean, it couldn't really not be finer. Had, had you thought about 
values at all with either of these boxes? Well, uh, only frightfully vaguely. I mean, I, I know that this, this one being so damaged obviously will have lost a lot of its value, but I mean, no, I really don't know. No. Just some very vague idea. As it is, even with the damage, I would say with this box, we'd be looking at at least 1,500 to 2,000 at all. Really, auction. that much, even, even with the damage? Even with the damage. And properly restored, uh, one would obviously be looking at significantly more. This one, I think we're looking a wee bit more. As it is, I'd be quite happy in saying that at auction, I would expect that box to be selling between four and six thousand pounds. Really? Gosh. And I would be insuring it nearer to the eight to ten thousand pounds. Gosh, that is a lot more than I thought it was worth. Oh, look! One of these lovely little sort of early Art Deco figures made by Lorenzo, the great name. But I have to say, it's the nice. box you brought it in that really interests me. This is a beautiful leather suitcase. And presumably it's come down through the family? It yes. has. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't my mother's. She bought it round about 1920. And um, having the original brushes with the, um, with the beautiful wood backs uh, is, is an added bonus to a suitcase like this. Normally, I wouldn't expect to see you've, the original contents. And look. You've even got the, uh, the manicure set. I mean, it really is a little time capsule. If you wanted to sum up, um, the 1920s travel arrangements, then you've actually got quite a nice little hoard. In their own day, these leather suitcases, crocodile skin suitcases, um, were highly valued and came with their own outer cover. That's right. the cover you'd have for traveling. You've got the original thing. I mean, there are shops which specialize in selling luggage and suitcases of this period today. And I, I think I'm right in saying that if you saw a piece in this condition with its content, you could expect to see a price tag anywhere in the region of 700 to 1,000 pounds. Just for the suitcase. <laughs> well, what a charming young girl. Isn't that a lovely expression she's got? It's a total serenity, isn't it? Beautiful. What, what sort of history have you got with it? It actually belongs to some friends of mine who knew I was coming today and they asked right. if I could bring it. Um, the date of this is second half of the 18th century and it's a Chinese mirror picture. So if you break the glass, you've broken the whole thing because the, the painting is on the reverse of the glass and the detail is such that they put the gold there, for example, goes on before the dress. The decoration there would go on before the fabric of her skirt. The pupils go on before the eyes. It is totally in reverse. I see. All right? Yes. It was a technique that the Chinese developed. We tried to do it in Europe, but with less effect. And I think, basically, done for the European market. Now, um, it is a very fragile work of art, obviously. And insurance for this would have to be in the region of four and a half thousand pounds. Lord. So take care on the way home. I better wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really is such a treat to see such a pure, untouched and unrestored piece of Regency furniture. Mm -hmm. I mean, opening the top, I mean, the colour, it looks completely unused. Do you, do you ever use it, or is it kept no. very much against the wall? No, it's very much against the wall, yes. What really is unusual about it is the mechanical movement, which, mm -hmm. if you could very kindly give me a hand in just... Yes. I'll try and open the top, if you hold on to there. As you can see, a little bit stiff, but the... Um, the way that the legs close mean that you are able to sit and play games with your knees without banging against the trestle end. It's yes, a yes. really very ingenious idea, which I've never seen before, actually. Did and you I buy did. it in a shop or...? Yes, in a shop, yes, and I've still got the, the ticket for it, too. Oh, have you? Yes. When was that? 1947. Do you remember how much you paid for it? Yes, £14.10. Well, that's not a bad buy, actually, I think, really. Um, mm. If that was to come up at auction today, I think it would be worth in the region of three to five thousand pounds. Oh gosh me. So it's well worth looking after as it is. It was given to my mother in one of her places of work many years ago and it belonged to the boss's mother and she was an actress somewhere but that is all I know. You know where it's made? Where it was made? I don't. I haven't got a clue. Well, I, we'll look on the bottom and we will find here this is the mark of the Worcester factory. 
Royal Worcester factory, your crown and your W's, and underneath you've got the date 75, I think it's 75, it might be 76. But anyway, it's either 1875 or 1876. Right. So it's 120 years yeah. old. Must do a very complicated thing to, to make all these little pots so carefully yeah. arranged, little little amphoras. Um, I can tell you, because he, he signed it, that a, a Mr. Willoughby, that W.Y., he did the gilding. And then the man who painted the birds was called John Hopeful. And what makes it particularly good is, and, and what collectors like, is this yellow. Yellow ground is always mm. makes an object it's more bright, expensive. It? it is very bright, not too bright. It would be brighter if um, it was washed. Carefully. Did I dare wash it? <laughs> oh, why did you dare wash it? Yes. Um, who did this? I don't know. Yeah, pity, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, because you've lost one, two, three, three handles yeah. and a chip. Mm -hmm. So, it has reduced its value a bit. Right. So I think uh, something about 350, 400 pounds from mm -hmm. you. One of the problems often with Victorian pieces is that some of them are so big that they're very difficult to wear. Do you wear it? Is no. it the you don't? Why? No. Well, I've only had it about six months and I haven't had the occasion. Ah, but when you get the right occasion, will you I wear it? I think I probably will. Because it lends itself for wear. Mm. If you were to put that on the side of a dark outfit like mm. that, it would look absolutely stunning. It's late Victorian mm -hmm. and it's in, I suppose, one of the most popular wildlife themes, which is well, I suppose I would call it a bee. Mm -hmm. Now, it's mounted in gold, mm -hmm. but what is the most significant thing about it is the body, where you've got this lovely, natural, dark grey coloured pearl. Mm. It's ever so slightly misshapen, but the fact it's mis it is not a perfect round pearl lends itself to the general design of the piece, because you've got this sort of, it sort of goes into a pointed top, which then nicely goes into the sapphire cushion shaped cluster mm. in the middle mm. and then the eyes are set with rubies little little round cut stones so you've got all the color there but look at the diamonds in the wings lines of little old cut stones with this veining between turning it over and you can always tell the quality of a piece when you look at the back because quite often with pieces of victorian period the back gives it it just doesn't look the same but in this piece You've got this super gold cup that forms a setting to the pearl itself. Then you've got, looking at the veining here of the diamonds, you can see it's all very beautifully cut out. Do you like the piece? I mean, is, yes, is I it do. I do yes. like it. Yeah. I think it's very pretty, and it it means a lot to me sentimentally. It does. Mm. Okay, now. There it is, a very commercial piece, and I would suggest that in auction it would probably be worth around about £2,500. That's a lot. Well, it's because it's such a commercial mm. piece. Thank you. This is a wonderful varied collection of children's shoes. Yeah. Have you been collecting them a long time? About four years. Um, they difficult? are very difficult to find, uh, certainly to start with. But uh, Which was your first? My first pair. pair were those. I Ooh, found those the biggest in an antique the shop in, uh, in the Cotswolds. That's quite an older child, isn't it? I think so, yes. Um, they, they vary. And which, was, which is your favourite? My favourite. I quite like those. These ones here? Yes, and I quite like the shape of those. Right, these are wonderful. Yes, aren't they they're lovely. These. I can imagine some work in those. Yes. yes. And um, these, you said? Yes. Yes. Actually, those don't look the same as all the others. I would have thought those were American. They look very American to me. But um, what I, um, I see a lot of are these kinds, because yes. they are bought for large dolls by the doll yes, dealer. That's right. Yes. And I think these are my favourites. Mm. Um, to work in those. I know. The isn't it beading wonderful? and the. Is that jet? Th this is jet, mm. yeah. Cut glass, really. Oh, nice. and, yeah. and jet. Um, and so much work in them. I'd love yes. to know what sort of prices these Well, I started off 
paying about £40 on the average, but as I progressed and I found slightly different ones, um, they, I think, were about £80. Well, I think that's probably about right. You must have bought them from dealers. Yeah, I bought them from a shop, actually. She was selling her collection. Yes. So you haven't had any sort of really fantastic bargains? No, not really. No, no I just collect them because I love the shape mm. of them. And I just wish they could tell me where they came from. Yes, and who wore them? That's yeah, what I exactly, love. Exactly. And really, I mean, how many pairs altogether? 71 altogether 71. At, at the moment. Anyway, I think you have got a great collection. And if you say you've got 71 mm. pairs, and you've paid about right um, on average, 30 yes. to 40, some a bit more, yes. we're talking about a collection of £3,000 already. Wow. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you. Thank you for bringing them in. <laughs> Thank you. To see one three-barreled pistol is unusual, but to see a pair is rare indeed. They actually belong to this man, and this man is your great, 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 great uh, uh, Whichever, yes, and he Marvelous. was born in 1705. Yeah. But isn't that great? There's the man who owned the pistols, and here are the pistols. We're very fortunate. These pistols would probably be carried by him on journeys if he had to go by coach somewhere and um, do a journey with money or valuables and they would be his protectors. To describe the action to you, when they load these pistols, they put powder into that trough there. And then, with this little catch here, it's sealed off, right? Right. You cock your pistol and close up your frizzle. Now she's all ready to fire. Right. Having pulled the trigger and the frizzle going forward, the cock coming down, those two little holes would take the charge through to these two barrels. Having done that, and you've missed him with two barrels, you then cock your pistol, reveal the lower chamber, close your frizzle, and you can fire the pistol again. So it's quite something. And of course, I see the maker is Ketland. Yes. Now, he was a Birmingham gunsmith, and he came to London in, in about 1760. These pistols would have been made around about 1770. One pistol on its own today would fetch about £700. So you've got a pair. Today, I think you would get between £1,500 and £2,000. Right. But it is possible that two people wanting those pistols could pay more. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you Thank for you. bringing them in. If you're fortunate enough to own an oil painting, the chances are that you either bought or inherited with it some problems. They might be problems caused by too much sun, too much central heating, or rising damp. Peter, what's the most common problem in your experience with oil painting? Well, when we talk about problems, we have to realize that oil paintings start with artists. And it's artists that can cause the first problems. If they do not prepare their materials right, if they do not understand how they are going to mature with history, yes. they cause the problems for you very often. And here we have a typical example. What's gone wrong here? Well, this, uh, if you look at the paint here, mm. it, it is puckered. And puckering is where the paint has almost remained liquid and the surface has, has risen, it's come into ridges, and you can see that here. And that's, quite, that's the most difficult problem in a way to correct. But it's not actually caused by too much light or heat or anything like that? It could be caused by too much heat. Mm. It could be caused by bad preparation of, uh, of the materials. It could be far too much oil in the paint, for instance. So it's remained too liquid too long. In fact, we should perhaps go back to here to see the original preparation. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a painting here on canvas. Yep. That's one medium. We have one here on a wooden panel. But almost all paintings have a traditional dressing of white gesso. You see, that, that has a white base. That white base serves two purposes. First of all, the gesso is made of a, a, a liquid chalky substance, mm -hmm. which makes the surface absolutely flat, mm -hmm. but it's something for the paint to adhere to. Mm -hmm. If it's not prepared properly and put on properly, you can get puckering, you can get spreading. Now this is much more easy to deal with. Here the paint has spread, but 
this can be filled and touched in, and a restorer can fill in that touch in, you can never see it. Whereas this is a much greater problem. And finally, what about cleaning? Should, should, a, should anyone ever attempt cleaning themselves? Absolutely never. I mean, these works of art are not, even if we paid for them, they are not our possessions. They are the possessions of future generations. It's a, it's a great science cleaning, and we have, there are marvellous restorers, and we must go to them. Peter, thank you. Do you play forfeit? No. Shall we start? Stop. <laughs> what you have is a ball covered with lots of numbers, and before the game starts, you agree between yourselves what the forfeits are going to do, and you write them out on a list. And then, when you're bored of an evening, you take out your forfeit ball, and you, you roll it around, and you have a wonderful time uh, in the party trying to get people to do embarrassing things. <laughs> now, now, this object is actually made of clay, and at one stage it was glazed, but the glaze has rubbed off from, from loving use. And judging from the numbers, this was manufactured in Staffordshire sometime around 1800 to 1820. I suppose you want to know what it's worth? Well, shall we find out? Oh, uh, yes, what a good idea. <laughs> 26. Well, let's multiply by 8, shall we? I think I cannot see you buying that in a shop for under £200, and it may well be worth a good deal more than that. Well, what a surprise. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> you know, we have more Bibles on the Antiques Roadshow than almost anything else, um, but this one is quite an exception. It's a lovely um, edition. It's slightly soiled. Some of it is slightly soiled. Um, one printed in um, Zurich here in Switzerland, and the year is 1560. And it's a lovely illustrated Bible. Here we have this wonderful picture of um, God making woman from Adam's rib here. He looks as though he's having a bad night, don't you think? I mean, he doesn't look at all happy. But all these wonderful animals. This is a little woodcut plate here. This is a lovely. Bible, where did it come from? It's uh, been in my family as, as long as I know. Um, it was brought over from Germany with, when my father came over before the Second World War. Yes. And I love the binding of this. This is the... Uh, it does in fact have woodwork, doesn't it? Yes, I know. This is a, a pigskin over oak board. And from what I can see of the binding, it is absolutely original. Now, often people actually write in Bibles, and I noticed that somebody has written in here something that I can't make out. But what I couldn't help noticing yes. was at the other end of the Bible, we have happily married yes. Helen Billy Goldsmith, that's 1639. Yes. Who's that? That's my mother and father. Oh, I think that's absolutely lovely, because it's, I rather like the idea. I presume he must have given it to her. He did. At this date, did he? He did, yes. Well, that's absolutely splendid. Now, the, the Zurich Bibles, um, the first edition of this particular edition came out in about 1520, mm. and there were subsequent editions of it, but any edition is yes. desirable. Have you had it valued at all? Well, I was told it wasn't worth anything. As you said, you always have Bibles. Oh, yes, no, no, no. Of course, it, uh, it's a sentimental thing yes. for a start. I yes. mean, it couldn't be any better because yes. it's your, right. you know, in your family, That's so true. it's worth everything to you. Exactly. But a market price, if we have to put a market price on it, I suppose would be somewhere between £1,500 and £2,000. <laughs> the lovely thing, I'm glad you bought it in. Thank you ever so much. Right. You know, I, in my whole life, I've never seen one of these. I don't see <laughs> No, I, uh, I know what it is. I mean, it, it's a, a caddy spoon. Mm -hmm. And it's in blue jasper. Blue oh. jasper is this solid stoneware, blue stoneware, made by Josiah Wedgwood. Yeah. And it has a particularly special feature on it here. Yeah. It has the word Wedgwood in upper and lower case. Now that tells us that this was made in the 1770s. So it's very early. Now, if that was a silver one of the period, it would be worth about 80 pounds, maybe 120. But since it's a Wedgwood one, it's worth an awful lot more. And I think that this funny little thing is worth 
a thousand pounds or oh, slightly more. I don't believe it. Yes. Oh, good heavens. I mean, it's an extraordinary rarity. What you got there? Oh, no, two of them. I mean, that's disgusting. <laughs> I mean, that really is um, uh, quite incredible because to find one is um, remarkable. To find two is... Perfect. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. This is uh, a German mystery clock oh. dating from 1900, give or take a year or two. And do you have it running at home or not? Um, no, because it doesn't keep very good time. Right. It's actually place. tricky to regulate it, but as you know, that fits there. Yeah. And then it swings away. And apparently it is perpetual motion, but we know, of course, that it's not. No. Mm. To regulate it, you do the reverse of what you do for an ordinary clock. So if it was running slow with a normal clock, you would reduce the size of the pendulum to make it run faster. In this instance, if it's running slow, you lengthen the pendulum. Oh, so you're doing it in reverse, if yeah. you get my meaning. Hence, we call it a mystery timepiece. Mm. And almost certainly made by one of the factories like Jungen's. But this one isn't signed on the dial. So, price-wise, any thoughts? Not really, no. <laughs> we, we were given it about six years ago by a relation. Um... Oh, that's a lovely gift. Yeah. It's a good object. They've come up in the market dramatically over the last two or three years. And I would have no problem at all in retailing a piece like that for about 750 to 800 pounds. You're joking. I was told that it was an Elizabethan stomacher. Well, you're right in one part and wrong in the other, because it is a stomacher, but it's not Elizabethan. Now, an Elizabethan stomacher would have been longer. It was a piece of material that was designed to go from the chest down to just below the waist because in those days um, the dresses were open in the front and we're talking about a date of about 1700 to 1740 so you had open gowns worn over a petticoat and the extraordinary thing about dresses in those days were that they were pinned together so in the morning when you got up you would be pinned into your clothes, your dresses wouldn't have been sewn. So the stomacher would have been pinned onto the outer garment. And very often it would have had a, a support that ran up the, up the back called a bust, which was made of wood and could have been carved by your lover with some in inscription, because it was something that you would have worn every day, so it would have been close to your heart. And it would have given it support, because of course it wouldn't have been any good on a canvas backing if it was all yeah. flopping around. Yeah. And what I like about it particularly is it's really glowing colours still because so often the light daylight has faded the colours out but here you've got this lovely pink and a very bright apple green turquoise and all sewn onto silver and gold threads at the back and the silver and gold threads show that this was for a special occasion they don't survive in very great numbers was this given to you or how did you come by it it was given to us as a wedding present that's by a very a original wedding present, <laughs> if I may say so. <laughs> by a maiden aunt. And she said that um, she particularly wanted to give me this, this little present. Um, although they are very rare objects and they haven't survived, this was obviously kept carefully away out of sunlight for a good many years. Having said that, although they are rare items, you might expect them also to be extremely valuable, which is in fact not the case. And um, beautiful thing would probably be worth somewhere in the region of about 500 pounds mm. but for me the pleasure of seeing something in such wonderful condition is really mm. priceless yeah. Yeah. well I don't think you could have a more suitable piece of furniture for a program from Wadston than this isn't it lovely um, Louis XV style Bureau de Dame in the grandest, grandest manner. Now, before we start looking at it, tell me something of the family history. Um, well, it was left to me my, by my great aunt, and she traced its history back to the Cobb family, who apparently owned Cobb's Brewery from Kent. And that's really? as far as it went, yes. Well, that would fit in, because unlike Louis XV period, 
this style was copied and continued throughout the 19th century. And by the 1890s, it had become extremely fashionable again. There was one maker, Francoise Link, who copied this design and, and produced much of this sort of furniture around about 1890, 1910, that sort of period. If we look at the construction, of course, the, the workmanship and the craftsmanship is the same, if you like, as the, as the patterns of the 18th century. This is a parquetry pattern. The pieces are applied one against another, not built up as, and applied as a picture like marquetry, but each piece, rather like a parquet floor, is carefully cut and placed so that all the veneers match round. And as you step back, of course, the grandeur of these mounts is very, very strong, very heavy, and very beautiful. And if we look carefully, you can see here, if you look at the flower heads, even though they're chased and pounced, it, it's a marvellous hand-finishing technique, which you don't get with cheaper copies. And of course, there were cheaper copies, because everybody liked this shape, and they reproduced them in various standards to fit every purse. How about the leather? Um, the leather, well, this is the original leather surface. And I prefer to see the old used leather than a bright spanking yeah. new one. However, I should tell you that in the 18th century, French desks, they changed the leather every year. Sometimes according to the season. So they had bright blues and reds and greens. But I think this has mellowed in with the rest of this. Bearing in mind, these colors were much more vibrant when new. So, an important looking desk. Um, quite a stunner, really. What sort of, uh, has it got a price on it? Do you have it valued? Well, when my aunt left it to me, she, uh, a letter came with it, and she said to insure it for £1,850. This oh. was in 1991. 1991? Yes. I'd, I'd insure that for £18,500. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I pushed my premiums up. <laughs> <laughs> what do you use your jar for? Well, that actually belongs to my mother, and at the moment it's standing in her fireplace. But it did, for about four or five years, stand outside on her patio. With plants or something? Well, yes, yeah. just a plant yeah. in well, it. Well, that seems quite a sensible thing to do. What, what do you do with yours? Well, it's actually belonged to my husband's grandmother, yeah. and when she died, it was handed down. I said that I liked it at the time, and she was like, oh, if you like it for you, you can have it. And your mother got this? Uh, actually, a friend of uh, my mother's gave it to her about... 20, 25 years ago. So, in, in a sense, they're both gifts. Mm. Well, they are two quite similar pieces in so far as they are both Chinese. Um, but let's take yours first, because this one is covered with a classic Chinese flower, the lotus, which forms the whole backdrop of the whole jar. This one was made for the export market, and this one was made for the domestic market. This is a very typical Chinese shape with typical Chinese, rather formal borders, whereas this is what the Chinese were producing, uh, which they knew would go down well in Europe. One particularly nice thing is your lid has totally different decoration on. We've got little Chinese gentlemen sitting here in the panel. And in between, these stems, do they remind you of anything? Uh, does it suggest anything to you? Lilies to me. Lilies, that's right. Well, you see, um, the Chinese buyers then knew what the Europeans wanted. Uh, over in Europe, and so they provided um, mm -hmm. something that resembles Delft in parts of the design. Mm -hmm. But I suspect that when this was taken off the shelf, um, they took the wrong I lid. Couldn't, I didn't think it matched. Yeah, at well, all. You're, you're absolutely right. But the, the, the fact is, the porcelain is of the same period. Now, this is really rather nice to have two jars side by side, one of, both of which are Ming dynasty. So we rather uh. call it the Ming, but it's not <laughs> worth a <the> fortune. <laughs> Now, yours Gosh. was made um, towards the very end of the Ming Dynasty, sometime between 1600 and 1620. Really? Yours was made maybe around 1540, oh. 1550. It should have a lid like this mm. one. It should have a lid. Mm. And this was actually a, a domestic mm. object for mm. wine. It's known as a guan, a wine jar. Right. Mm. What are they worth? Um, do you have any idea? Do you have it insured? Do you, you don't have it? Do you have it on no. insurance policy or anything like that? Nothing, no. Well, I think if you sold this one in today's market, you would get somewhere between um, three and four thousand pounds. Oh, gosh. You don't know what this one's worth, do you? Oh, yeah. 
yes. <laughs> you are off right, Do I get to a couple? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think this would quite happily fetch somewhere between seven and ten thousand pounds. Oh gosh, my mother's going to be out in the garden. You Back to the garden. <laughs> oh God, how much? Between seven and ten thousand. Stood on a pantio in all weathers for year well, and a year. Why not? It's interesting to think, really, that almost from the time this picture was painted, for 50 years, if you'd said you'd like this painting, you would have been pilloried because it was totally out of fashion. Mm. I mean, it's a 20th century picture, but left over from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about it? Who it's? I believe it's uh, Lady Diana Cooper. Uh, I've been told that she was married to a gentleman called Duff Cooper and I believe he was in the society that uh, mixed around with uh, Edward and uh, but, Wallace Simpson. But you've never checked it out? Never had it checked out. This is the first time, as it were, it's come out of the closet. I don't think it would be very difficult to check whether it was Lady Diana Cooper. I think um, she is obviously in her best ball gear of the era. It's sort of 1915 to 20, isn't it, this period? Mm. And the Wantner um, is, as I say, a leftover from, he's an Edwardian artist and later leftover from the Victorian period. I mean, when he was painting pictures like this, he was a dinosaur, really. Yeah. <clears throat> and yet he has all the wonderful use of paint of the Victorian artists, of his peers, of the pre-Raphaelite glazes, mm -hmm. of that sort of clarity of skin values that Lord Leighton has. And he is an, he's both a portrait painter and a neoclassical artist, so he crosses those realms. But really, he and his kind should have died out in the First World War when that great social revolution happened. There's one thing I, I do notice about this picture. Is there a heavy smoker in your family? I smoke a pipe. Do you? <laughs> so you're responsible, are you? Well, actually, it's not hung. We're in a small cottage, and we don't have a room uh, large enough for it. I have to say it's kept under the bed. Well, I think, I mean, actually, I think you'd be astounded. I think when it's cleaned, you can see little areas of rubbing here, mm. where actually this would be almost a very light ivory white instead of this rather yellowy colour. And all these pure glazes of the um, beads and the costume would come through. Still, it is quite a sought-after picture. Yeah. And um, I would say it would be in the region of 25 to 35,000 pounds. Goodness gracious. Do you think she might possibly re-emerge from under the bed? I think a little bit of tender loving care, as you suggest, and some cleaning, and uh, maybe we will find uh, a, a wall space for her, yes. I hope so. Thank you. Well, the end of our day here at Waddesdon, and it's just started to rain actually quite heavily, but we can't complain because we've been very lucky so far, and those people still left to see our experts are inside that rather large marquee behind me. The end of our day, but not actually the end of our visit, because we're back here again next week when we'll be showing you some of the great treasures inside Wadston Manor, together with hitherto unseen highlights of our series so far. So I do hope you'll join us for Wadston Part 2 next week. Until then, goodbye. Father Peter's left holding the baby next on BBC One in Bally Angel. of the BBC Homes and Antiques magazine features the Ming pot and other surprising treasures found in this month's roadshows.